Daisy gets all quaky. We meet some pink Cree. Gemma's compassion opens up a whole new world. And Colson learns that working for Grill has a really steep downside. But a great view. It's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Season 5, Episode 3. A Life Spent. Hey everyone, D here, and welcome to this week's review of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So yes, of course, spoilers are a-coming. Alright, so nice episode this week. Uh, not a lot of huge moves, a lot of chess peoples moving around, a couple of awesome uh, scenes, however, and uh, great views of the Earth from out in space. So, uh, let's kick things off with Gemma. Uh, who is just not really in the best place in Cassius's employ. I have to say, all those scenes where she's under the influence of the device in her ear, uh, whatever it is, so claustrophobic in its sense. I mean, without the sound, everything is very muted. Even the visuals are all like you almost have to, you can only see right in front of you. Sort of gives you that, that tunnel vision feel. Uh, but Gemma, very observant. And this is uh, going to really play into her uh, her scientific training here. If she knew how to read lips, that would probably be even more effective. Um, this would be a good time to have that particular skill. But at least she is keeping an eye on things, and that's sort of where we start things out this episode. Uh, we get to meet Abby, our inhuman. Uh, we get to find out, yes, Inhumans still around, 18th birthday, they are subjected to terogenesis, they find their powers, and then they have a period of time, they didn't really uh, clue in how long, uh, until they attend the ceremony, uh, which seems to, at least in Abby's mind originally, seems to be a presentation of what you can do, and if you're successful, you get to be an ambassador, you get to tour the galaxy, meet new and interesting people all over the place. Um, not, not quite Abby. Really, she's going to be running into, <laughs> into some disappointment here, which, of course, where Gemma is brought in to help sort of, uh, you know, bring her around. Uh, Sonara made the comment to uh, Cassius later on, of why Gemma was brought in, because of her compassion. Uh, apparently, in the uh, post-apocalyptic future where everybody is striving and working and scamming and scheming just to stay alive, compassion isn't a, 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 a big commodity in the world. Um, but it was just, we had some really good scenes there. I liked Sam having Gemma kind of make her, her, her connection in with Abby. It was very sweet. Obviously, her familiarity with Inhuman sort of pays off, considering she was originally not very pro-Inhuman. You know, very nice evolution for Gemma. I've liked where everybody has gone uh, over the years. Um, and I just, I just love the whole uh, teaching sequence. I love the idea of the space between the stars. Of yes, we are just made up of atoms, you know, protons surrounded by electrons. You got neutrons in there by the protons there, and that's it. Most of us is all empty space. So the idea of being able to pass through objects, very natural, uh, decreasing density that way. Well, I like the increasing density also, uh, which was sort of super cool to give a full range of her powers. Um, I was a little curious uh, when we did have that little scene between Sonara and, and Cassius uh, right after uh, uh, Abby was pulled out. Uh, yes, you succeeded once? Great, that's all you need. Let's yank you out of here and send you on to the ceremony. Uh, uh, when she asked Sonara, was like, did you set her up to fail? Or how did you know she was going to succeed? It, Cassius seemed a little upset. Um, that Gemma was able to do something. He didn't seem happy. I don't know. Maybe Cassius is just not generally a happy person. Sonara seems to want to be able to, to, to see him happy, but I just, I, I couldn't understand why he seemed upset and concerned. I thought he would be a little bit more happy that Gemma might be able to help Abby use her power, considering that the ceremony is actually more of a, uh, a battle test 
a battle audition if you were. Survive and you're great. If you don't know your powers and you're weak, you're out of here. Uh, uh, yeah, and I don't even know if she had like any battle training, if Abby had any battle or fight training at all. It's just like, throw her in, she's like, okay, so a demonstration of power. Ah! <laughs> it's kind of a lot to throw at a girl um, right there. But considering that the whole point of this is so that he could be able to sell her uh, to, to Lady Basha there um, for some cash. If she does well, she, he gets more cash. Um, why would he be upset at, at, at Gemma? Anyway, it was just, that was one scene that didn't totally work for me. Um, but the fight itself, that was cool. Felt very bad. Abby getting her butt kicked, really is painful. Can feel it with Gemma too. It was sort of a nice, painful fight for Gemma to be here after she just met this nice little girl and now gets to go up and just see this huge guy just like beat the crap out of her. Really beat the crap out of her. Uh, it would have been more if it was a, if it wasn't ABC. Um, if this was the Netflix version, it'd be really messed up. Um, but once she grasps her power and takes that moment, I love the hyper density. I love that shot. It's my second favorite shot of the week. We'll save the the, the scene of the week for later. Uh, but when he does that hit and the hand just all crushes, uh, and then she reaches into him and pulls out the oh, it was just. That was, that was just a cool, that was a great way for a kid to absorb the powers, you know, step into that moment. Uh, I, I just love that hand crushing, uh, and then her begging, don't make me do this, stop, and then, well, gotta survive, one way or the other. So, cool to see this. Uh, I, I loved the great fight scene, but of course, what we're seeing here is more of the machinations of what Cassius is doing here. He is the one setting up uh, shop on the earth getting the earthlings to do all of this stuff. A uh, lot of layers going on. One of those is certainly using any inhumans in the population to breed for mercenaries, for warriors, uh, uh, in order to sell on the pre-market. Now, of course, with the arrival of Lady Baja and her uh, companion, her little group there, we are introduced to Pink Cree. Yes, Cree don't just come in the blue color, they come in pink as well, very human-like. Um, Captain Marvel, who we will meet, I'm sure, later on in the movies with the Captain Marvel movie, uh, was a pink Cree. Uh, the Cree were originally blue, they ran into, they were became genetically stagnant, they started doing some interbreeding with other species, and then you had the pink Cree, uh, who are pretty much human-like, except for, of course, those red eyes. Um, the Blue Cree became sort of a, a vocal minority populace that, uh, you know, like the pure bloods. Um, so a lot of caste stuff in this society, which made me kind of surprised that Lady Basha seemed to be higher than Cassius. Um, but, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of layers inside of, of, of Cree society. But uh, it does give us a new alien species, well not really, again, new alien species is subspecies of an alien we already know, uh, but certainly costs less makeup for, uh, for production, so uh, that's very cool. But it's just nice to sort of, again, we get this nice expansion of the Cree uh, civilization, get a little bit bigger uh, insight into them. And Daisy, uh, yeah, we can see she and Deke really hitting it off. Again, quick destroyer of worlds. Stop calling me that! That's doesn't make one feel very good. Um, so, you know, just really, the, I gotta say, the Quake scenes, the Daisy scenes kind of annoyed me. I mean, look, I understand that she wants to go after Gemma. I want her to go after Gemma. We all want her to go after Gemma. But Daisy's a much more experienced agent. I know that she's always been impulsive, but this seems to be too impulsive of a move, even for Daisy. Um, jumping in, not really knowing where she's going. She's got kind of a map, doesn't know anything about the lay of the land. Uh, Deke does try to tell her, look, I can help you. Just give me time to do it. Let me do this right. Let me get a pass. Um, but Daisy, no, man, just, just charging right in. Uh, and, and this is where... This is where I actually feel a little compassionate for Deke. I know at the end it seems like he's a bad guy, but... I don't think it's quite that much because he does try to convince Daisy, look, I'm not worried about you. I'm worried about the blowback 
effectively. You go in, causing havoc, killing people, taking out uh, uh, Cree, all of that, the response is going to come back on the rest of the human population inside the lighthouse. People are going to die. Like he said, it was just three before. Um, it could be 30 if they go in and do another one of those, you know, kill spree, those little renewals. Um, so that is sort of Deke's concern. This is where he lives. He's been here his whole life. Yes, he's a scavenger. Yes, he's a little bit of a mercenary. Yes, he's, you know, maybe a bit on the edge of things. But I, I don't think that he's really a bad person in the sense. He's just certainly willing to live in those gray areas. So yes, he tries to get Daisy not to go and run in. Of course, she doesn't listen, charges off. Uh, I did love the scene in the elevator where she's hiding up there and Charlie starts to slip and they look up. What? I love that they look up and just didn't look around like stupid people. Intelligent guards are nice. Uh, and just her line, really thought this was going to work. That was awesome. Uh, very personal. And a great fight scene. They really have done so much with these fights. Uh, all of these actors got to be constantly training. You know, Melinda um, uh, Migna is, is amazing, all of her fight stuff. Uh, Daisy has really been, been kicking it up, kicking butt. Uh, it was just, I love the whole sequence. I love the three dimensionality. I love the grabbing and running along the, the walls and kicks and, and all that. It was perfect. It was beautiful. But it's noisy. So, of course, she's going to get cut eventually. And yeah, it does seem that Zeke is the one that sort of turned her in. But his last line says it. And to me, that's what referred back to what he was telling her about before is, I'm just playing the long game. She'd gone in and caused a whole bunch of, of, of ruckus. It was going to blow back on the lighthouse. And the big question is, and this is what surprised me of why Daisy hasn't really thought about this, is, okay, she goes in, she gets, da she gets Gemma. What then? Where's she going to go? Where's she going to hide? It's just a station inside the rocky crevice of a blown-up earth. Not a whole lot of places to hide. Nowhere to really disappear off to. Especially not after all that, you're going to be hunted by all of the Kree. So there was no move after getting Gemma. That, and I think that's what uh, Deke had seen. Is that you're going to go in, you're going to cause all of this, and then it's just going to be ruckus. If you survive, if you get out of there, they're going to tear the whole station apart trying to find them. Why? Because they can't let the humans or inhumans be able to show a position of strength. It will undermine everything that Cassius is doing. And they will make the rest of the humans pay. So that is what Deke is doing there. That's him playing the long game. Look, I told you not to do this. You put yourself in. I've got to stop you from creating bigger havoc. Um, and then hopefully be able to find some other direction to move on after that. Why he called her Quake, though, and kind of opened up that door for Cassius, because that could expose the rest of the group, potentially, I don't know. It could have just been any Inhuman, could have been anyone like that. Um, but, yeah, really kind of curious about why, why he revealed that that was Quake. All right, and as for our main group, Coulson and company, uh, working in the rock mine or rock processing for a uh, grill there. What do they do, actually? I guess, you know, the ships go out, they just open up the mall, and pull in a bunch of rocks and just sort of space debris and then sort through it and see if any of it's useful. useful? Seems to be sort of the plan there. Um, anyway, just, just not a good job. Very rough. I am kind of curious, how much do they owe grill, actually? How long, I mean, is it just, you're gonna work until I say you're done? I mean, he said the little tablet wasn't enough, but he still took the tablet. I don't know. I think that uh, I just I don't trust Grill with that. And Grill, obviously, not really trusting anyone, so sending Zeb off on the little uh, scurrying mission <laughs> with the group. I love them getting out. And I mean, again, you gotta you gotta love Phil being out to go and and enjoy the moments in space uh, and and see the view. I love the little Felinda moment that we had. 
the connection between Phil and May was awesome. Uh, curious about that leg. She's not really... <laughs> I love that. I don't want to lie to you. And that was it. She didn't say anything else. That's May. I'm not going to say that I'm weak. I'm not going to say that it hurts. But I'm not going to lie to you either. Uh, but it was a cute, nice little moment. Um, Phil certainly kind of surprising being like, hey, maybe we're supposed to just be here in the future saving humanity. I mean, that's sort of a Phil thing. I'm here to save people. But I love May's response. And it's really, it's really useful. She spent weeks inside the framework thinking that she was working for Hydra. She gets out, gets sent off to the future in post-apocalyptic space station on the husky remnants of Earth. Yeah, I think she deserves a night in her own bed. When it's all done, I think it's good that she would get to go home. Uh, nice Easter egg, if you guys picked that up when they were looking at the objects that Virgil was going after. Object 616. Yeah, 616 is the Earth designation for the standard Marvel Universe, Earth 616. So uh, I thought that was kind of a cool little moment there. Uh, but, oh, and the, the Earth holding the little knob. And I guess just you need that knob to open up the radio box. Nobody would think to go in there, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, uh, that was just, it was kind of a cool bit. Uh, nice little fight there with Zeb, knocking him out. I guess when you find the knob, you get easily distracted and don't think to look anywhere behind you when you know there was someone else on the, uh, it's not a Quinjet, on the spaceship with you. Um, maybe just pay a little bit a little bit more attention to that. Uh, but things uh, actually, you know, not really ending up well for Zeb, as, <laughs> as it all turns out. I'm sure Mac felt very good being able to punch him out. Um, very much like his scene back with Yo-Yo, which I also loved how he went in and did an entire scout run. And yeah, he got hurt, and yeah, he got a little thing put up in the wall inside of Grill's place, but able to take a look inside, see everything in there. Mac's smart. Mac knows how to use it. But he did kind of mess with Yo-Yo, so hitting and taking out Zeb there, that big old punch, I'm sure that felt great. Uh, but this all comes down to discovering the radio message um, from somebody on Earth, for what it seems. We don't know who it is. We just get a note on the delegation, but there is somebody there. So now we've got a next step for Phil and company to go and, uh, and, and search out. Now, of course, within all of that, we have sort of Tess's moment. Um, uh, very concerned about the attack to Superior, Zeb, that's going to mean death. She and, and Deke, of course, are, are really trying to show the reality of living in this world. A life spent is a life earned. That is like the math commodity for this world. Everything is an exchange. You step too far, people are going to be taken out, and that's the only way that other people are going to live. Life spent, a life earned. That's the reality of the world. So Tess going through a lot through this whole experience. Um, but in the end, also willing to kind of put herself on the line when they did go back to Grill and they did have, you know, that kind of moment of, of, of choice that she's saying, look, I did this. These people don't know Virgil. They weren't here a while ago. If there's anything, it comes down to me. So even in the midst of all of that, still willing to take it on herself to try and protect everyone else. So Tess, while she's living a harsh life, really is one of those people that are always going to try and do the right thing uh, whenever possible. Now, of course, cannot end a review without talking about our scene of the week. And I bet you know what it is right now, because it's the only thing that I haven't talked about, and that is the very awesome Yo-Yo Rodriguez. Uh, going to get the tablet out of Grill's office. That was awesome. I love the whole setup. She's just sitting there working at her table, and Grill's working, and then she's... Brands! Activates the, uh, the, the tracker. Oh, still there. Oh, do it again. Do it again, and then you know that she just, like, ran all over the place at that last little shot. Go in, take it out, 
And again, all of this involving taking things out of your wrist and then getting them slammed back on. That's dedication. That is committing to your cause. But of course, as soon as that's off, boom, beautiful special effects. I really love how they do the yo-yo uh, runs there, how we're getting little trails of her every few feet behind as she moves a little bit further to go and get the, uh, get the tablet and then go and drop it off and get it to Daisy and then go all the way back before Grill notices anything. That was just perfect. Again, the whole setup, the whole plan for it, the whole commitment, it was wonderfully done. I love getting to see Yo-Yo do some badassery stuff. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> when you're working in the rock mine, you don't not get much of an opportunity to do it. So, uh, very cool to see. I love the shot. It looked great. I was just sitting there watching and pumping my fist, super excited. Uh, awesome. And then, of course, we don't see it, but of course it's all implied at the end there when they end up uh, framing Zeb. Because there he spotted a gun inside of Grill's office. So she just went in, grabbed it, tucked it into Zeb before anybody saw anything. Alright, just a couple of small things. Uh, one, our roaches from last week are the Vrelnexians. Uh, they are a very obscure Marvel race. They actually only appeared in one issue uh, 1973's Thor 212. Uh, they're basically a space-faring insectoid hive-minded race, very much like the Brood, but the Brood are, of course, owned by Fox through the whole X-Men and uh, um, Fantastic Four deal, so that's why you couldn't use the Brood. Use the Vrel. Of course, with the oncoming um, Marvel Fox deal, that may no longer be the case for too long. Uh, which also is an interesting thought, because the next several movies have already, having already been filmed, uh, because S.H.I.E.L.D. is sort of a weekly series, it is entirely possible that the first Marvel mention of Mutant, uh, X-Men, or possibly Latveria could be in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, we did get to see uh, controls for Gemma's little ear thing. Uh, Sonara had one of those could be able to turn it on and off, which I think could be a very useful for a potential Gemma escape plan there. Um, but we also, of course, see little power inhibitors for, uh, for the Inhumans. Um, and that's going to, I think, play a really important role now that Quake has been captured, because you know that they're going to affix one of those to her straight away. All right, so the last shot that we got of Zeb apparently on the surface of Earth, all windy and so on, and that's where the Vril Nexians are living, and so ah, I just came over and got him. Uh, I guess that's why they didn't want to go to the upper levels of the station, because it's in the crust that's closer to the surface. That's how the Vril can get in. Um, well, that was a cool shot and certainly scary, no, you would not have an atmosphere at that point. There, there's not enough gravity, there's not enough surface crust, uh, there's not enough mass of the planet to be able to hold an atmosphere, I, I don't think. I mean, it looks like less than be on the moon and there's nothing on there. Uh, I mean, it could potentially hold an atmosphere for a short little while before the cosmic winds, I guess, tear it off potentially, but I would think that whatever took out the rest of the Earth would have sucked that atmosphere out of there in a heartbeat. And when Phil first hears the radio transmission and it's all garbled uh, through him when he's sitting there on the uh, on the spaceship, is it just me or did that sound very much like a Star Wars probe droid? Oh, and finally, best advice of the episode, the shoe guy knows all. All right, so I think that pretty much covers everything. So now we have Phil and company, the delegation, now aware that there are some people living on the surface of the Earth, somehow avoiding the Vrel, so that is going to be the next place, of course, they're heading out. And we have Daisy, now a prisoner of Cassius, probably about to see sent down to the Inhumans Gladiator Arenas, fighting for cash and sport and just 
psychotic Krill joy, uh, Cree joy right there. So, uh, <laughs> and at least he'll get, she'll get to meet Gemma. So, I mean, kind of a plus there. She got what she wanted. Uh, but that is going to have to wait until next week. So, thank you so much for joining me with this review. If you enjoyed it yourself, please go ahead and hit that like button. Thoughts, ideas, comments, throw those down in the section below. What do you guys think about this episode? Do you think uh, Daisy had an actual plan going into things? Or was did Deke maybe do the right thing? Kind of cutting the knees out from underneath her. And do you think Deke actually is playing a long game here? Or is he just looking out for numero uno? And then, of course, we have who do you think's on the earth? Who's waiting for our team? Throw your thoughts down in the section below. Now you can always catch me on Twitter and Instagram. I am at Darren Jakes. If you're not a subscriber, please join us. It's quick, it's easy. Just hit one button and you'll catch a whole season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. reviews. Do that by clicking my face right here. And I'll go ahead and throw up our latest couple of reviews right here and you can check those out. So, that's it for me. I'm D, and I'm out of here. I'll catch you guys next time. Bye-bye.